At first glance, Onibaba and Kirineko seemed like blips in the long career of Japanese director Kineto Shindo, a man whose work is commonly, and not always helpfully, divided into the social and the sexual. At first glance, the two films sound similar, as if with Kirineko, Shindo was repeating a successful formula. But Onibaba and Kirineko do not just fit seamlessly into Shindo's extensive filmography. They are arguably the films in which his dominating concerns are best expressed. And while they are similar stories with similar themes, they are very different films, like flip sides of the same coin. They are also two of the most atypical films ever to be described as horror. Whether or not Onibaba even is a horror film is a reasonable question, but it is certainly shot through with horror influence. It is tense, brutal and visceral. By turns slow and silent, then wild and loud. It creates an atmosphere of unease, using a low angle perspective to submerge us into a sea of whispering grass, also reflecting the lowly status of those who live here. Like so many Japanese films that have made their way into the Western consciousness, the film opens with samurai. But these are not the heroic figures of Kurosawa, nor do they last long. This is not a film about samurai, but about their killers who are startlingly revealed to be a pair of peasant women, mother and daughter-in-law, played by Nobuko Otoa and Jitsuko Yoshimura, though we never learn either of their characters' names. The pair eke out a living by killing samurai and selling their armour, the bodies dumped into a deep hole. For the first ten minutes of the film, no one speaks. There is work to be done. Work is the constant in this world, and we feel every beat of it. Nothing comes easy. Staying alive is a constant battle in which the women have to kill to earn a few bags of millet. The arrival of a man ought to make life easier. One more person with whom to share the labour. But he throws the dynamic into flux. Firstly, with the news that the son and husband is dead. Then, as he lusts after the daughter-in-law. Who is unable to resist her own urges. Leaving the mother fearing for her future. And desperately frustrated. So far, the narrative is compelling but it's what happens next that skews the story toward horror. Not a demon, but a samurai in a mask, which he refuses to remove. He goes the way of all samurai in this film. Forcing the mother to descend to claim his armour. So much for the handsome samurai. Now the mother sees an opportunity. And when the daughter-in-law heads to Hachi, <coughs> Onibaba, by the way, means demon woman. Throughout, Onibaba maintains an overwhelming feeling of oppression in every sense. The claustrophobic rushes, the heat, poverty, social class, sexual frustration, all underscored by the thundering drums of the soundtrack and enhanced by unflinching close-ups. When the daughter-in-law first goes to Hachi's hut, she doesn't knock at his door, she throws a rock through it. There's no emotion here, this is primal. And yet sex is the only thing that seems to result in some sense of happiness and liberation from the oppression of everyday life. That oppression reaches its zenith as the mother uses the demon mask to control her daughter-in-law, playing to her fears and scaring her away from her lover. But not even fear can get in the way of sexual desire and freedom. This time, when the daughter-in-law returns home, it is to a shock. She learns the truth, 
but there is a twist. And here is the film's biggest question. Is the mask stuck on as a supernatural punishment? Or has the woman contracted the same skin disease as the samurai, making her face stick to the mask's interior? I said that there is a question over whether or not Onibaba is horror, but actually that's wrong. The question is whether or not it's supernatural horror. Is this punishment from the gods or a medical condition? It doesn't matter. What happens next is certainly horror. And it gets worse. Remember all that hammering earlier? Until... The question of demon or human being is addressed more directly in Shindo's other horror masterpiece, Kuraneko, or Yabu no Naka no Kuraneko, the black cat inside the bamboo grove. The similarities between the films are evident. Both are based on Japanese folklore. Both follow a peasant mother and daughter-in-law whose son stroke husband went off to war. And it features two of the same actors, Nobuko Otoa and Kichiyamon Nakamura, who played Hachi, is now the son. Both films have light coming from nowhere to enhance a moment. Bamboo replaces the grass of Onibaba, but it returns for one scene, a deliberate thematic link, as are the peasants stealing samurai clothes. Like Onibaba, the film's opening 10 minutes is dialogue free, and we start with samurai. Again, they are not heroic, but this time they are the predators, and the women, Yone and Shige, their victims. The length of the rape is underscored by cutting outside, then back within to the men, watching, waiting their turn. They are not people, but an act of God, wreaking havoc, then vanishing. This opening immediately establishes this to be a very different film to Onibaba, but it is also the last time that Kuraneko is as visceral as its predecessor. Kuraneko is explicitly supernatural in its subject and lyrical in its style. Even a drunk samurai chasing a woman is graceful, almost a dance, a world away from the violent desires of Onibaba. This is slow, elegant, restrained, until... To a degree, we knew this was coming, as Shindo has been teasing us with hints. After the shocking opening, a cat feeds on the women's bodies. They seem to be dead, and yet here they are, alive, and apparently greatly risen in social rank. Something is wrong. Hair that twitches like the tail of a cat, a hand that becomes a paw, and... These women are no longer human. They are enacting a supernatural vengeance against the samurai as a class. <laughs> Through repetition, a pattern is established. A samurai is waylaid by Shige, then led back home and invited in for a drink. Yeah, he is tempted, invariably succumbing. And of course, <laughs> the women kill again and again. One man is smart enough to figure out something is wrong. But that doesn't save him. The samurai's shared culpability is embodied in the character of Raiko, a hero of Japanese legend, here portrayed as a privileged and self-indulgent ass. The samurai deserved to die. But then we meet Jintoki, iconically heroic. and undeniably masculine. He is also the missing son, and is now tasked with killing the ghosts. We know the pattern by now, but this time, Jintoki suspects the truth, but cannot confirm it perhaps does not want to. He needs to believe that this strange woman with whom he spends his nights is his lost wife. The intensity is similar to Onibaba, but here it is tender and loving. 
and tragically fragile. By failing to kill Jintoki, the daughter has broken the agreement the pair made with the evil gods to suck the blood of samurai. If the underlying tone in Onibaba is of oppression, then Kuroneko is shot through with a sense of duality. The house in which the ghosts live seems a living part of the bamboo grove, yet also moves through it, at once there and not there. The mother and daughter are simultaneously woman and cat. <laughs> Dead and alive, peasant and noble. Such is the strength of the class system in medieval Japan, Jintoki cannot even recognize his mother and wife as nobility. But then again, the difference between a roughneck and a samurai is just a few buckets of water. Now Jintoki must choose his master or his mother, while Yone must choose between her son and the hell into which Shige has already fallen. But Yone is no longer strictly Jintoki's mother. And in the ensuing fight, Jintoki cuts off Yone's arm. When she comes to reclaim it, we get the film's most macabre image. Leading into the final confrontation. But even in its wirework action, Kuroneko is tempered with tragedy. With its violence and desperate physicality, Onibaba feels like a horror film, but almost entirely lacks traditional horror elements. Kuroneko's story is traditionally horror, but the film is a delicately woven romantic tragedy. Their imagery is extraordinarily powerful. Drawing on Japanese myth, but presenting it in stories that seem starkly modern. Shindo does not wallow in his chosen period. He uses it to make his points. Both films show how the samurai's long war has left the peasant classes. A dog killed for food is Onibaba at its most brutal. While in Kuroneko, the samurai are oblivious and uncaring. There's no question whose side Shindo is on. He's even willing to forgive the murders in Onibaba. They were forced into this. Just as Jintoki's new social position forces him into an impossible position in Kuroneko. For Shindo, the rigid social order of medieval Japan is a metaphor for inequities he saw around him in modern day life. Extreme examples of a universal struggle between the haves and have nots. What about the film's sexual content? In conversation with Joe Mellon, Shindo said, My idea of sex is nothing but the expression of the vitality of man, his urge for survival. His protagonists may be in the depths of despair. They have lost their loved ones and are without hope. But they survive. And that desire to survive, to meet the unjust challenges of a harsh world, is represented through sex. It often sounds that, to Shindo, the film's horror aspects were probably not that important, a means to an end. And yet he portrays them with such brilliance. The atmospheric cinematography, and jump shocks. <laughs> the landscape of grass in Onibaba into which the samurai sink, never to surface again, becomes the tensest of settings. Like the film itself, it never stops moving, never stops whispering. Is there something coming to get you? You would never know. The bamboo grove of Kuroneko is the exact opposite, a static and silent architecture disappearing upwards into the darkness. It's telling that both films exist to some extent in self-contained environments, like naturally grown haunted houses. Worlds on which Shindo could impose his own rules. Worlds turned upside down. 
天地にも異変が起こるらしい今年は真夏に氷が降るしかと思うと飛ぶ鳥も落ちるほどに照りつけて日照りとなるし夏じゃというのに霜じゃあられじゃ天持ちもひっくり返ったんじゃの Worlds where peasants kill samurai but worlds populated by real people Finally if there is a single theme that defines 20th century horror film from the victims of Nosferatu to those of Jigsaw it is the overwhelming human desire to survive Even in the rich horror tradition of Japan Shindo seems an unnatural fit his chosen stories certainly draw on the past and his stark style paves the way for J horror of the future but ultimately they are shindo films tough to compare to anything else and all the more to be treasured for their uniqueness thanks for watching if you've enjoyed this check out other dark corners classics and don't forget to subscribe